Yes. Okay, so thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, let me mention my collaborators, James Bonifacio, who's a postdoc at Case, Laura Johnson, who's a student at Case, Austin Joyce, who's here, and Rachel Rosen from Columbia. And I'll summarize these two papers, one of which should come out soon. So we know that when we have broken symmetries, we always have a Goldstone boson. So a Goldstone boson is some flat direction in field space, which means we have a symmetry that starts with just a shift of the field. So the general symmetry transformation is going to be a shift of the field, maybe with some higher order stuff. That's telling us that the vacuum is not preserved if phi equals zero configuration is not preserved. Whereas an unbroken symmetry, which preserves phi equals zero, starts with a field dependent part. And the fact that you have this leading uh, constant part tells you that the kinetic term has to start with, uh, with a massless kinetic term. And then the interactions uh, will be determined. If we want to know about interactions, if we suppose for a moment that the shift symmetry is exact, that it's not corrected by any higher order stuff, then we know that the most general interaction is just going to be a function of the derivative of the field. So the derivative of the field is like your invariant building block that you can make invariant interactions out of. Uh, and then there's one exception, which is just linear and phi, which is the Wesumino term, which is uh, not made out of the building block. It has fewer than one derivatives per field and is invariant only up to a total derivative. So this is kind of the boring uh, abelian type of interactions. Uh, there's also interesting non-abelian interactions if you allow for field dependent terms, which would give you the, the uh, linear sigma model, for example. If we look at the kinetic term, it's also invariant under the Galilean symmetry, which shifts by a, uh, a term that's linear in the space-time coordinate. And again, for this, we can write down what you call, like, call boring interactions, which are made out of an invariant building block, which is two derivatives of the scalar. But there's also a set, a finite set of interactions, which are Wessumino terms. They contain fewer than two derivatives per field and are not made out of the invariant building block. And these are the Galileans. We can also ask for interactions that extend the uh, shift symmetry by field dependent parts. That would lead you to DBI theory or, uh, or conformal DBI as another example. So this non-trivially deforms the uh, trivial algebra of the uh, ordinary Galileans. We can keep going. The kinetic term is also invariant under a shift which has two powers of the field where you uh, contract the two powers, uh, sorry, two powers of the space-time coordinate, where you contract them with a symmetric traceless constant tensor. Traceless because that's uh, when you have the, the box of the kinetic term acting on it, it'll give you zero. We can now ask for interactions of this. And again, you can find boring interactions where you have three derivatives of the field and it doesn't uh, deform the algebra or anything. But there's one type of interaction you can write down which is not boring which has fewer than three derivatives of the field and which has this non-trivial deformation of the algebra. And this is uh, the so-called special Galilean, where you only have the quartic Galilean interaction and nothing else. This is invariant under a, uh, a, a double shift in x like this. If we keep going, the kinetic term is in fact invariant under any power of x, as long as it's contracted with a symmetric traceless tensor like this. But there don't seem to be any interact, uh, non-trivial interesting interactions of the non-abelian type beyond uh, order two. So you can get at this by studying the possible algebras that you could get from a deformation, and they don't seem to exist. So the special Galilean seems to be as far as you can go, at least with a single scalar on flat space. Okay, so the question I want to ask is, how does all of this extend to curved space, and how does it extend to higher spins? Interesting in the sense that it's not just uh, uh, in, in, uh, building blocks that give more, you know, you can always make interactions by just putting enough powers of derivatives on the field and writing functions of that. So that's what we'll call abelian theories that are, that don't, def so the algebra of symmetries is the same as the algebra of the free theory. Okay, so in talking about ADS space, it'll be convenient to use the uh, embedding picture. So we think about ADS or De Sitter as a hyperboloid embedded in a Minkowski space of one high 
dimension. And then we can talk about tensors on ADS space by extending them to a tensor in the ambient space. And in order to do this extension uniquely, you demand that the tensors in the ambient space satisfy these two conditions, a homogeneity condition. So you have to decide on some homo homogeneity degree mu for the field and some transversality condition. And once you enforce this, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between tensors in the ambient space and tensors on the ADS space. So then you can do uh, any equations you write down on the ADS space. You can translate them into equations in the ambient space and vice versa, and there's rules for doing that. Okay, so let's consider now just a free scalar on uh, ADS space. Uh, free massless scalar. So this still has a shift symmetry, but all the higher uh, symmetries with the higher powers of x's are now broken because we're on the ADS space. However, it turns out that there is a special value of the mass of the scalar, uh, d times uh, Hubble squared of the background, where d is the space-time dimension, where you preserve a Galilean symmetry for this scalar field. And the Galilean symmetry you preserve is essentially the uh, ambient space Galilean symmetry. So it's some ambient space constant vector, so some five-dimensional vector times the ambient space coordinate. So there's five symmetries which form a vector in ambient space. And then if you try to take the flat limit, this will become massless again. And these five ambient space uh, vectors worth of symmetries will decompose into a vector in scalar, which gives you the Galilean and the shift symmetry of the flat space theory. And it occurs only for this special mass value. There's another mass value, a different mass value, where we have an embedding space symmetry, which is a, a version of the special Galilean symmetry, so a symmetric traceless embedding space tensor. And if you take the flat limit, it breaks up into a symmetric traceless tensor, a vector, and a scalar, which is like the special Galilean symmetry of flat space, the ordinary Galilean symmetry, and the shift symmetry. And you can keep going. There's a whole series of masses labeled by k. So k equals 0 will be the ordinary sh shift symmetry. k equals 1 will be the Galilean. 2 will be the special Galilean, and so on. And at this mass value, you get this embedding space symmetry, which reduces in the flat limit to the extended Galilean symmetry of order k. And one way to think of where this is all coming from, it's just the higher dimensional Laplacian is invariant under all of these things. And then when we pull it back to the, uh, to the uh, ADS hypersurface, it generates this mass term. And depending on the scaling that you use, which has to be consistent with the symmetry, you get these various mass values. The same thing now extends all the massive higher spins. So a massive spin S field on ADS, there's a sequence of special mass values labeled by K where you get a, uh, a uh, shift symmetry, which is now parameterized by a mixed symmetry tensor field that has uh, two S plus K indices like that, which is symmetric in the S plus K and, and has this uh, uh, mixed symmetry form. So here's a way to visualize what all the special mass values are in terms of uh, the dual CFT operator. So here's the uh, spin on this axis. And here's the conformal dimension, which is basically just the mass. So it's these integer conformal dimensions that you're finding. So here's the shift symmetric scalar. Here's the Galilean. Here's the special Galilean, and so on. And here's a vector version of the shift symmetric uh, field, a vector version of the Galilean and special Galilean, and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just in the sense that the uh, that the Laplacian is a Casimir for the for the for the ADS group. Another way to understand the presence of these shift symmetries is that these special mass values all come as longitudinal modes of partially massless fields. So let me explain that. So uh, a partially massless field on ADS is a symmetric tensor, massive symmetric tensor field of, of spin S. Uh, and, and if you look at the, if you look at the uh, Lagrangian for a massive spin S field on ADS, there are special mass values 
labeled by this, by this depth parameter t, which goes from 0 to spin minus 1, at which you get enhanced gauge symmetries. And the form of the enhanced gauge symmetry is that the gauge parameter is a symmetric tensor of rank t. So uh, the massless fields are the ones where t is s minus 1. And then these are generalizations where you have these uh, gauge symmetries by higher derivatives and different ranks of gauge parameter. So what this gauge symmetry does is it eliminates the helicities, the lowest helicities up to helicity t of the massive spin s field. So here's where partially massless fields lie in that same picture. So we have spin again going here, conformal dimension of the dual operator going up. So again, these integer conformal dimensions. The massless fields are all going up like this. So here's massless spin 1, massless spin 2, and so on. These are dual to, to uh, conserved, uh, conserved charges. So uh, if I hit it with a P, it vanishes. The partially massless fields are the ones that are below the diagonal. And these are what you might call partially or multiply conserved charges. You have to hit them by multiple P's before they vanish. But they're all short representations of the conformal group. Okay, so here's uh, how to understand these shift symmetries as arising from the longitudinal modes of the partially massless field. The simplest case will be a massive vector. So consider a massive vector now on ADS space. So here's the Lagrangian for our massive vector with the, the mass m squared. And now try to take the massless limit. So we know that to take the massless limit smoothly, you have to introduce a Stuckelberg field to capture the longitudinal mode. So we introduce a Stuckelberg scalar phi. And now that has a Stuckelberg gauge symmetry, where we uh, have a lambda type gauge symmetry on A and a shift by lambda of phi. Now in the massless limit, the Lagrangian decomposes into the massless spin 1, the massless spin 0, and the gauge symmetry the m kills the transformation on phi, so phi becomes gauge invariant in the massless limit, and a gets its usual Maxwell gauge transformation. So in, in looking at this, it doesn't seem like there's any symmetry that's emerging on phi. So where does the shift symmetry emerge from? The shift symmetry comes in if you look for a gauge parameter, which is a so-called reducibility parameter. So a reducibility parameter is a value for the gauge parameter such that the gauge transformation on a here vanishes. So in this case, a constant lambda is a reducibility parameter. And in that case, if, if this vanishes here, then I can rescale lambda by m so that it survives in the massless limit. So if I do that, there's a, uh, a uh, massless shift symmetry on phi that survives the massless limit. So we can understand the shift symmetries as arising from reducibility parameters of the partially, or, or, or of the, of the uh, photon in this case, in the massless limit. So this generalizes to the higher spins as well. If I take the massless limit of a massive spin 2, the uh, gauge symmetry I have to introduce is a diffeomorphism symmetry, linearized diffeomorphism. And the reducibility parameter now, the thing that causes the gauge symmetry to vanish, is just a killing vector on ADS. So if I take the massless limit, I now get a massless spin 2, as well as a massive, uh, a massive spin 1 which is shift invariant under a killing vector shift of the, uh, of the A. So the killing vectors are parameterized in embedding space by an anti-symmetric tensor, which is precisely the uh, k equals 0 value of the spin 1 shift field that we had before. A uh, similar thing happens for the partially massless limit. If I take a massive spin 2 and approach the partially massless limit, the longitudinal mode now is a scalar. So I have to introduce a scalar Stuckelberg. And now there's a reducibility parameter, a set of them associated with the scalar. And the reducibility parameters have to satisfy an equation that this vanishes, which is like a, a conformal, uh, like a, uh, a killing tensor type equation, where the tensor this, at the, in this case is a scalar. And the solutions are parameterized by a simple vector, which is the Galilean shift in ADS of this, of this particular scalar. So for general spins, there's a branching rule. If I take a massive spin S particle and I approach one of these partially massless points, it breaks up into a partially massless field plus a shift symmetric field, which is the longitudinal modes breaking off. And the uh, shift symmetries of those longitudinal modes are precisely the reducibility parameters of the uh, partially massless gauge symmetry that's being reintrodu reintroduced in the massless limit. So in terms of this picture, 
uh, if, I tr if I take some generic massive field and I approach one of these partially massless points here, the uh, shift symmetric field that breaks off as the longitudinal mode is just the reflection about this dotted line of the part of the, um, uh, and, and that's, the part, that's the shift symmetric field you land on. And this symmetric dotted line, these are the conformal uh, values of the field. So this is the conformal scalar uh, and the analogs for all the higher spins. Okay, so this was all for free theories. So the question is, are there any interactions that preserve these shift symmetries? Can we write down interacting versions of the Galileans and so on? So for this, we study the algebra of symmetries and we ask whether we can non-trivially deform it. So we have, as part of the algebra, the unbroken symmetries, which are just the ADS isometries. So the commutators of these are just SO D, D plus one, form depending on whether you're on ADS or De Sitter. And then there are the shift symmetries. So we'll do the scalar case to be simple where the, where the um, symmetries are just a symmetric tensor in this embedding space. And we have this leading part and then we're going to ask for possible nonlinear deformations. So we know that because this thing is a tensor in embedding space, it transforms covariantly under the ADS isometries. So the, the uh, commutators of the J's with these shift symmetries is completely fixed. So the only unfixed commutator is that between the two shift symmetries, uh, uh, that w the shift symmetry with itself. And by studying the symmetries of this left-hand side, there's only one possible structure that can appear on the right-hand side with, with one uh, arbitrary constant that's, that we have to fix. So we can fix that by studying the Jacobi identities. By looking at all the possible Jacobi identities, you can show that this constant has to be zero for any k greater than two. So there's no non-trivial deformations of the algebra for a k be beyond that of the special Galilean. But there is a possible deformation for k equals one or two, which is the Galilean and the special Galilean. Okay, so if we study just the boring abelian theories, that's where alpha equals zero and the symmetry is undeformed. We can build invariant building blocks, just like we did in the flat space case, where it's just the appropriate number of der numbers of derivatives now in embedding space, which when you pull it down is going to generate mass-like terms. And these will give you invariant Lagrangians, which will generally be, generally be ghostly, and they won't deform the algebra. In the case of k equals one, the Galilean case, it turns out there's a set of ghost-free interactions you can write down, which are made out of some uh, anti-symmetric combinations of these, of these um, uh, building blocks. And that leads to uh, so-called ADS Galileans, which we found from another point of view a while back. You can uh, look for now the non-abelian theories that exist at k equals one. So the unique deformation that we find with this alpha for k equals one, uh, the algebra that this forms is just a ADS algebra of one dimension higher. So this gives you a theory of a ADS brain embedded in an ADS of one dimension higher. So this would give you ADS versions of the, of the DBI theory and the, and the DBI type Galileans, which are also known. For k equals two, we're gonna get something new. So for k equals two, the only possible deformation is this thing. And if you study what that algebra is, so the generators are the anti-symmetric JAB, which are the isometries, and then the shift, which is a symmetric traceless tensor. So you can combine this anti-symmetric uh, tensor with the symmetric traceless tensor into a traceless tensor, M, and the algebra that this traceless tensor forms is just SL D plus one. So we get a breaking pattern of SL D plus one down to SO D plus one. And the theory that realizes this, we found a uh, Lagrangian, and it's unique, it's completely fixed by the symmetry. So it looks like a mess here. This is the, uh, so this is a, a single scalar living on De Sitter. X is, is D phi squared. Y is, is this phi squared combination. And then these things are just uh, like the ghost free combinations of uh, uh, anti-symmetric combinations of double derivatives that are familiar from Horndensky and other Galileans. So this Lagrangian looks like a mess, but it's completely fixed, nailed down by this symmetry. And if you look at this, if you expand it uh, in powers of the field, the leading part has the correct mass to be this k equals two field, and then there's complicated interactions. If you look at it in the flat limit, it's just the special Galilean. So this is an ADS or De Sitter deformation of the special Galilean. 
Another interesting thing is that it has a potential. So the, the Galileans and flat space don't allow for potentials, but here we do. The mass term is just the leading term in a potential. And the full nonlinear potential looks like this. So this is the only example I know of a scalar field with some non-trivial potential, which is completely fixed by symmetry. Here it is in arbitrary dimensions. The Lagrangian has hypergeometric functions. Here's the potential. You get more and more wiggles as you go up in dimension. Another interacting case we found was with vectors. So uh, you got this vector, this shift symmetric vector theory by considering the massless limit of massive spin 2 on ADS. You can do the same for fully nonlinear massive gravity. You can consider a decoupling limit where you keep the background fixed to be ADS. And in that case, what's left uh, is an interacting, self-interacting theory of the longitudinal massive vector. And that self-interacting theory has now a non-abelian shift symmetry. What about the Sorry? What about the Say that again? Proca, yeah, Proca, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, so the leading part is just the shift by a killing vector, and then there's nonlinear interactions. And the algebra that's formed here is uh, SOD plus 1 squared, two copies of SOD one, uh, D plus 1. So the algebra here is two copies of the ADS algebra bring, being broken down to some diagonal. Uh, and we can study the lat massless limit of that, by the way, and you get a new shift symmetry of the vectors that appear in the decoupling limit of massive gravity, even in flat space. Okay, so that, those are the only interactions that exist just with a single, uh, a single scalar. But we think that there's, by studying what, what are possible in terms of the algebras of, of multiple fields, there's a sequence of algebras that were written down by these guys, which they found by considering uh, various finite dimensional truncations of partially massless higher spin algebras underlying partially massless higher spin Vassiliev types theories. There's this sequence of algebras that seems to exist that close on, upon themselves and have these various field contents of shift symmetric theory. And, we, and these, the fact that these algebras exist make us think that there should be theories that exist that generalize this special Galilean. So what we found was this one here with a single scalar, but we think the next in this sequence of algebras is some complicated theory like this, which has two scalars and of, of certain masses, a, a, a vector and a tensor, and should all form some, some interacting shift symmetric thing. And in the limit, there should be some shift symmetric theory with an infinite tower of fields, which you might think of as some longitudinal mode of Vassiliev theory. If I have some generic massive theory and I take a massless limit, it should somehow break up into Vassiliev theory plus a huge shift symmetric theory of longitudinal modes that's self-interacting. Okay, so in summary, we, uh, we saw that massless fields of all spins on ADS develop these shift symmetries at particular values of the masses labeled by this integer k. These, can, these correspond to longitudinal modes of partially massless gauge fields, and we found interactions that preserve these shift symmetries in the cases where we think they exist, uh, corresponding to ADS Galileans and the generalization of the special Galilean in, in one case with the vectors. But we believe that there is this more complicated family of, uh, of interacting theories, and what we need is some good way to to deduce whether Lagrangians actually exist uh, given just the symmetry, because the coset construction is hopelessly complicated for these, these algebras. Uh, so I'll stop there. Thank you. So uh, among your examples, there was one where the Lagrangian was unique. Yeah. In what sense it was unique? I mean, it's, it's in the derivative expansion or it's unique? Uh, it's unique in the sense it's the only one that has a two derivative kinetic term to start with. So there will be higher derivative examples. Oh, there are higher derivatives. Yeah, yeah. Because but of normalization, then you generate them. That's right, yeah, yeah. Other questions? So in flat space, when we have uh, uh, nonlinear symmetry, right, so we can make some statements, exact statements about an S matrix. Mm -hmm. Say there are massless poles, and there are some soft theorems. Yeah. So now in ADS, you made some statements about Lagrangians yeah. for now, right? Yeah. 
So can you, I mean, I guess analogy would be some boundary correlators. Yeah, so can you actually argue anything about boundary correlators as a consequence of this symmetry? Yeah, that's what I'd like to do ultimately, to know what, what are the consequences for boundary correlators of this, because that would be a much cleaner way to search for the existence of these things than dealing with Lagrangians. But I don't, don't yet know how to actually do that. Is there at least analog of Goldstone theorem so that these masses which you find here they directly translate to anomalous dimensions and don't get quantum corrections or right so those yeah they should not these should be protected but dimensions yeah so is it yeah yeah but for yeah. scalars for, for scalars yeah it's not because of shortening it's because oh. of because of this shift symmetry the fact that they came as like a longitudinal ro mode of some shortening it, it, they used to be null mode states but can, can yeah so can you show that so is it a uh, proven statement that this shift symmetry I implies that an anomalous dimensions not not beyond just the fact that the, the, the lagrangian has that symmetry so if you compute it should be preserved but uh, beyond that i don't i don't know how to how how one would show that directly for no, the correlator mass so. appearing in the lagrangian is not the same thing as anomalous dimension at the quantum level right so right you have to show that like loops and things right, don't exactly correct the mass yeah. but yeah You mentioned that for uh, some of the uh, scalar theories on top of the sitter, something goes wrong. There are some pathologies. So can you just mention it, for example, which? Um, uh, so th well, the, the thing you might worry about is the mass. The sign of the mass term is wrong sign on the sitter, and it's correct sign on ADS because it's proportional to, a to so h squared. So it's only the mass that is goes tachyonic? Like yeah, so the mass goes tachyonic, but if you look at what that instability is. So there's a particular mode where it's just rolling down that mass-like instability. That mode always corresponds to one of the shift symmetries. So we think that there should be some sense in which you can shift away that unstable mode. And so I was wondering, it, uh, is this tachyonic instability happens for all, all of these ex extensions of shift, shift symmetry? or Yeah, for, well, for all the scalars oh, okay. in particular. Yeah, we haven't looked at the higher spins. So, so the statement about the two derivative Lagrangian when you're answering uh, Ricardo, does that mean that there's a non-renormalization theorem for that Lagrangian? If I did loops with that Lagrangian, any corrections would have to be the higher derivative ones, up to normalization of the Lagrangian? Yeah, well, certainly up to normalization. But uh, yeah, I don't know that if there's a non-renormalization theorem, you might correct the coefficient of but this. But the relative this terms, the relative oh, yeah, size yeah. of all the terms that, are all, all fixed. That's all fixed. Yeah, yeah. that's all fixed. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, if not, uh, let's thank uh, Kurt again. Thank